Okay. So, you know, I don't know. Janine Frost. Do you know who she is? Janine Frost is the author of the Night Huntress series. This series is one that was like genuinely transformative for my life because I discovered it when I was in middle school. I think it's seven books and it follows their main character Kat Crawfield as she like goes on undead adventures with her vampire husband. She's also like a half vampire hybrid. It's really complicated. It doesn't make much sense when I try to like explain it like that but that's basically the gist of it. From this original series there are several spin-off standalones and several spin-off like series. But what's the point? Why am I making a video about this? Well, I have a bone to pick with Miss Frost, actually. I'm so bad at reading scripts. I've never had to like fully make a script and read it before. This is really hard. Mm. I really love YouTube, like a lot. And I don't think that's like out of the question. I'm Gen Z. I started watching it maybe a year or two before I found Janine Frost's books. And I found them on YouTube, like the audiobooks. And I didn't know that it was illegal to have audiobooks on YouTube at this time. Like I was still literally a child. So I did not realize that these were like someone's illegal uploads. I just listened to them and was like, wow, I'm reading books and it's so much fun. I thought that I was going to have like a booktube channel because that's the kind of YouTube that I watched the most at the time. These books are the reason that I wanted to have my own booktube channel, my own YouTube channel at all. Like this was the start for me. But I mean, it's it's been a while. And here we are, I don't have a booktube channel and I'm not trying to make this a booktube channel. I just really wanted to talk about this. Like I've been thinking about this for a really long time and I had Vampire Month in February and I only posted one video. It just took so long to edit Vampire Academy and I was like, I. I can't make another one. I eventually like just gave up on the idea of having a booktube channel altogether. Like I tried to have one once and I wasn't really suited for it. Let me try other things and now here we are. And I'm happy with that decision. Like I love the way that my channel is going right now. Alas, I was on Miss Frost's website the other day and I made some shocking discoveries, some downright shocking discoveries. I can't, I can't, I can't not talk about this. Like, I, it's been so long. It's been so long. This is like my final push of energy out into the world about this. This is my, my last gasp of breath, okay? Let's start at the beginning because it's a long fucking story, dude. It's a long story. Oh my god. First, I want to preface this with a disclaimer. Um, everything I'm about to say is just one reader, this reader's opinion. Um, I haven't read most of these books since I was like 10 years old and they've just left an impression on me, which is something that you want out of like every piece of media that you consume. That's the sign of a good story, right? when we can't stop thinking about it and it like plagues our mind for years and years and years to come. If she wrote it a certain way that I don't agree with, it doesn't matter if I don't agree because it's her story and if she wrote it that way, that's the way it needed to be written. I am just expressing my love for these books in the only way that I really know how, which is like talking my shit. So if I didn't care about this series, if I just wanted to clown on it, I wouldn't be talking about it at all. With that said, let's Let's carry on, all right? Okay, so in regards to The Night Huntress, I read this series first. Like these were the first, I were they the first? The memories are flooding back. So the first ever audiobook that I found on YouTube was First Drop of Crimson, which is, I think that was like the first standalone spinoff from The Night Huntress. I remember listening to that one and just being like, I have no idea what's going on. And then I found the other books and I read those. Oh my god. Wow. First Drop of Crimson was the first one. I loved that one. I really like Spade a lot and I also really like Denise. Anyway, the Night Huntress series. Let's pretend that I did read that one first. I love that series. I think that Kat is a great protagonist. I really fell in love with her. I read it out of order, like 100%. Uh, I think maybe the fifth one first, and then I went back and read the first one and the second one, and then the third one. Yeah, because I remember I was reading the third one and they were like, oh yeah, Bones is dead. And I was like, no the fuck, no he's not. Like I read the other one, he's not dead. Like I was crying because it was like sad, but at the same time I was just like, this, he's not dead. <laughs> like he's 
he's not. But I mean, that again, that's the mark of a good story. Like I was still like really in it. I was still feeling it with Kat. Like, oh my God, Bay is dead. I neglected to mention this, but somewhere in there, I read the first Night Prince book. I do not remember when exactly, but I know that it happened. So that's that on that. Reading it out of order didn't make the story pack any less of a punch, which is a great, great thing because it's like an anthology series, kind of. Not really. Does that have to does that have to mean that it follows like different protagonists? It doesn't. The actual series, the Night Hunter series, follows Cat. It's just every book is like episodic, like they're fighting a different big bad. But yeah, this series was honestly my favorite series for a very, very long time. I think there were two of them that I didn't read until like a lot later on. And those two were the last one, book seven, Up From The Grave, and the fourth one, Destined For An Early Grave. And oh my god, Destined For An Early Grave is a fucking dumpster fire. Where to begin? Okay. So the premise for this one is that Cat and Bones have to fight this guy named Gregor the Dream Snatcher, who like, I guess wanted to marry Cat when she was a teenager, or I think he did marry her when she was a teenager, but then he had to leave. So he like compelled them all to forget. I don't know. Like he can, he can like penetrate her dreams or something. I really don't know. I, I don't know. I didn't finish the book because it was like, I, I'll get to that, but like, it, it just so, I don't know, man. It was so weird. I think I started it when I was still in middle school and I, like to this day, I have not finished it. I've only gotten like halfway through. I think most of my issues stem with Cat and Bones and like just the rest of the cast in general acting some kind of foolish. Usually with these books, what pulls me is more the characters than the plot. Cause like the plot is very, like when you actually stop to examine it, it does not make sense. Like beyond anything that's just like, oh, well it's paranoid. It does not make sense. The characters for me were what kept me coming back, you know? And for this one, no. <laughs> in every single installment in the past and past this one, I was totally there for Cat and Bones. Like they were probably the only healthy straight relationship that I'd read in adult romance. Like honestly, even to this day, like I, I struggle to think of a straight adult romance that's like actually really healthy. I think their relationship is like the only one that I can think of, but that was just completely thrown out of the window for this one. I don't know what was going on. They just started acting like they hated each other. Like Bones was treating Kat like trash and Kat was like being sullen and sulky and running away from her problems. Like even the little that we saw of Vlad, he was just like coddling her and like letting her act stupid and like a child. Like, I don't know what was going on. That's literally not his MO at all. It was just such a departure from the types of people that I had gotten to know them as, you know what I mean? Like they, they were just completely different. And I feel like if the rest of the books had been like that, I, I wouldn't have read the series. Like it's that, it's that different. Like it's, night and day. And I think that would be okay if not for the fact that this book was pivotal to the rest of the series. It was, it, it changed everything. Cat finally fully turns into a vampire. Cat's mom gets turned somewhere along the way. I'm pretty sure we establish a relationship with Marie Laveau and she's extremely important to like everything, even this bit, like everything. Just so much happened that you need to know for this book, but it's literally impossible to get through because the characters are acting fucking ridiculous all the time. I remember like before I read this book, I was so excited. Like, oh my God, I'm finally gonna get to learn like how Cat fully turned, how her mom turned. And then I start reading the book and I'm like, I can't, like, I, I can't, I can't read this. It's so bad. Oh, it was so disappointing. There's this specific scene in the book that I think like perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about. So at this point, Kat has gone to Vlad's house because she's avoiding Bones, I guess. He's just letting her sit in her room all day and cry. Bones comes to get her and he's like, oh, I'm gonna fight Vlad. I'm gonna kill him if you don't come with me. And she's like, okay, fine. And she goes. 
<laughs> and then Carries is there for some reason. I don't know why Min Carries is there. Like as a glorified referee, I guess. I don't know. I don't like Min Carries. I don't like him. I never understood why like Kat hated him so much. Like I, I've never hated him, especially then I thought he was fine. I was like, wow, Min Carries is so cool and powerful and old as fuck. Like that's so awesome. <sighs> I just really started to dislike him because of the scene. And then once I started reading the Night Prince series, I just stopped liking him altogether. But like the whole point to that scene is like Bones is coming to Vlad's house and acting up and making demands and threatening to fight him and all of that, which is like a huge sign of disrespect. It's a whole big thing and they have to fight. It's just, it makes no sense. How am I supposed to reconcile the strong, badass, independent woman that we have known for what? three and a half books now well that I had known for more than that because I read them out of order right this was like the last second to last book that I had read so how am I supposed to reconcile this woman who's literally sobbing on the stairs and expecting someone else to fight her battle for her literally with this woman who has been kicking ass fighting for herself doing what she thinks is best for herself this entire time how am I supposed to reconcile carefree steadfast living loose and happy respecting the woman that he loves with this dude who literally just tracked her down and is now going to force her to come with him on pain of death. How am I supposed to reconcile this hard unwavering self-proclaimed sociopathic Dracula who literally once talked Kat off of a ledge when she was gonna kill herself in book three with this dude who just lets her sit in her room and cry all day. Like, I, none of them acted like that before book four and none of them acted like that after book four. So it was just like a very random and intense departure from logic and I hated it. The whole sequence where Kat was in Vlad's house was just like the whole time I remember just thinking like, what is going on? From him inviting her from the military compound to them like playing chess that one time and then wait were they playing chess I think they were playing cards I don't know they were like playing some kind of game with Maximus and Shrapnel and that was really really uncomfortable to read and then they shared a bed I don't know why they shared a bed and it was so weird like they shared the pillow and he was like oh it's been a while since I've shared a bed with a woman I care about like what she's married and then Bones comes to get her and that whole scene was just so weird it was so bad and it was so uncomfortable and confusing like everyone was just acting like they weren't themselves it was so bizarre but that is like I really did love how that was called back in um Once Burned because Layla stayed in the same room that Kat was staying in at that time and she touched the door frame and she felt her sadness and oh that was great I loved that but like still it, it gave me flashbacks <laughs> to this nonsense. I have a few like general questions about Janine Frost's world. Well, not specifically about Janine Frost's world, but like just some general questions that I think I want all of us to consider as we move into this next part of the video, okay? Do you think vampires feel pain the same way? There are so many instances where vampires will get like extreme injuries that would usually cause a human to die, obviously, but for the vampire, it's just like a minor inconvenience because they're gonna heal in a second. Do you think that knowing that they're gonna heal like makes them think of pain differently or like register pain differently? There's a specific scene in book three at Graves End where Mancaries rips off Bones' Bones's arm <laughs> and Bones is just like, he doesn't even notice at first. He's just like, oh, you ripped off my arm. And then it starts to heal and he's just like, fine. Like he's having a conversation, like he's fully aware. He's not freaking out. He's not crying. He's not screaming. He's just like, oh yeah, my arm's gone. Do you think vampires like look back on the old days or like the days when they were actually alive and they're like, oh, I miss that time. Or like, do you think they're more adjusted than you would think? Like, do you think they notice the progression in that way. Like if you're a vampire who's like 400 years old, what was it like for you when you had to like get your house wired for lights? What was it like for you when you had to like 
get a toilet for the first time. I mean, I guess you didn't really need a toilet, but if you had like human servants or something, like what was it like when like international trade became a thing and like you suddenly had access to all of this food that if you're a Janine Frost vampire, you couldn't even eat. What is that like? Like, I just really want to know like how they wrapped their heads around that type of progress during that time. Like, it's just very, very interesting to me. Like, these are the kinds of things that I want to know. Like, Anne Rice, come on, interview with a vampire part two, but all the interesting stuff. Thinking about how they wrap their minds around progress also brings up the grand, grand question that I'm sure a lot of us have wondered in one way or another. How do vampires experience time? Are they aging? Does it affect them mentally at all? Like, how are they not insane having lived more than a normal human lifespan? in their same body with their same memories of like everything that's happened to them. And is it like a state of arrested development because their brain has literally stopped physically developing? Like, is that how brains develop? <laughs> I don't know, how, I don't know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really sure. If it is a form of arrested development though, why are all these vampires always so eager to be like, oh yeah, I'm just so old. Like you could never, you could never understand me. Your mind could never like fully grasp what I've been through in my hundreds of years on the earth. Like, are you in a state of arrested development or not? Lot says that to Leo all the time. He's literally constantly like, I'm built different. <laughs> like you just, I'm, I'm not a modern man. <laughs> Bones said that to her as well. I bet you can guess which book he said it in. Yeah, book four. He said that to her after he randomly threatened her and threw their fucking piano against the wall and smashed it. Oh my god, that scene was so funny. Like she walks in there like, oh, I really don't want to talk to him right now. I know he's gonna be mad. And he's just like playing a somber tune on the piano. And she's like, you gotta get over this. Like, I'm sorry, but whatever. And he's like, you know I could kill you right now. I could kill you and you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. And she's like, what? <laughs> and then he throws the piano against the wall. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> the book four was not, oh my God. I honestly don't remember if Spade said it to Denise. I don't know. I read that book like mm, probably more than eight years ago. Like, I don't know. Men carries though? I don't know if he said that to Kira. I don't even, honestly, would he even need to? That man is 4,000 years old. Get with him at your own peril. Like, he doesn't have to say anything. Like, he could just look at you and you'll know, like, oh, uh -huh. not him. Speaking of men carries, though, I, to this day, have not finished, what is his book? Eternal Kiss of Darkness or something? I haven't finished it because what are these covers, dude? Oh my god. Did Janine, like, forget to tell like the cover designers that this man is supposed to be Egyptian, as in North African. This man on these covers is white. He is white. And I know Egyptians are lighter than like other Africans typically tend to be, but they're not white. Oh my God. This man is literally gleaming white. I remember once I showed this cover to my friend and I was like, this man, he's Egyptian. Like he, he was a Pharaoh in Egypt 4,000 years ago. And she looked at it. She was like, he's white. And I was like, I know, I know he is. Despite what the historians of old would love to make me believe, Egypt is not a part of Europe and it does not breed white people. Oh my God. Anyway, thinking about how their minds are affected and if they're in a state of arrested development or not, I still have to ask the question, how can these old ass vampires be interested in and attracted to these young people? Why is a 4,000 year old man creeping on a 30 year old woman? Why is a 600 year old man creeping on a 25 year old woman? Why is a thousand year old man creeping on that same 25 year old woman? Why is a 250 year old man creeping on a 22 year old woman? Like what is going on? What do you have in common? I, I don't know, dude. Arrested development is literally the only explanation that I can think of that would explain this because nothing else makes any kind of sense. Like I'm 18 years old and I will see someone who's like even three years older than me and I'll be like, absolutely not. <laughs> Stay away from me. Like, I can't, I, it doesn't compute in my brain. Like, how can you be 
attracted to someone with such a huge age gap like even in that situation where it doesn't show physically they are so eager to constantly say i'm just built different like i'm from a different time what like what are you seeing in them what do you have in common? What do you have to talk about? The vampire has just been through so much that the human could like possibly like never understand. How do you reconcile any of your experiences? Like how are you having a real actual conversation where both of you are fully engaged and understanding what you're saying and and relating to one another like there's no way there's just no way when you're having a conversation with your grandparents or your great grandparents and they start talking about something that they used to do like back in the day and you're just like well, yeah that's cool like i don't know what the fuck you're talking about right like it's so hard to fully cognitively engage and imagine the olden days but imagine like you're talking to someone who is several hundred or several thousand years old and they're talking about their olden days and they have an immortal memory. They remember every single person that they've loved, every single person that they've lost, every single trauma that they've undergone. They remember it and they will always remember it and it will always scar them mentally. There is no kind of bridge between you at that point. You could never, I could never, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to be honest with myself on this one. I could never ever imagine, I don't want to imagine what it would have been like to go through a medieval war. I don't, mm, nah. I could never imagine what it would have been like to be a woman in fucking, I don't know, a thousand years ago. No, I could never imagine what it would be like to be a prince or a pharaoh or any of that. I can't imagine what it would be like to, to kill another, ew. I just don't think it's possible to have that kind of like reconciliation with someone who's been through so much and seen so much, like those wounds will never go away. I don't know. And if we're talking about Janine Frost vampires specifically, their emotions are all like heightened. Once they turn, like they feel everything so much deeper. So it's like, there's nothing, like I, as much as I would love to like <laughs> meet a vampire and like, settle down with one i guess we would have nothing to talk about they would try to explain it to me and i just wouldn't be able to wrap my mind around it. there's nothing that i could say or do or that they could say or do that would put us on the same level because we're just not like there's no way to bridge the gap of time there there's just really not you will never match each other in maturity at all unless you're in a state of arrested development like is it some twisted form of pedophilia i really hope it's not i don't think it is because like most of in most of these cases the women are still over the age of 18 so i guess it's fine it just feels very very fishy unfortunately we're gonna have to come back to the discussion of pedophilia which i'm not thrilled about but Janine Frost kind of implies a lot of sketchy stuff, but those are all my general questions. Let's actually talk about what we're all here for now, the Night Prince. And if you're curious, we are not even two pages through the script yet, so buckle up. Oh my god, 46 minutes already, damn, okay. As I mentioned, the Night Huntress series has several spin-off standalone novels and two? I think two at this point spin-off series. The Night Prince is the first spin-off series and it follows our heroine Layla as she encounters the undead world for the first time and she falls in love with a side character from the original series, Vlad Tepesh, Dracula. Layla is a former gymnast turned carny and she has some amazing, incredible, unprecedented powers that she got when she was 12 after an accident where her mother died. If she touches a person, she can see their worst sin and she'll experience that sin as if it's happening to her any time after she touches them. Like she won't see their worst sin again. She'll just see like their past, present or their future, form a psychic link with them and like telepathically communicate if they can read minds like Wad can. 
Yeah. The catch is that if she touches a person, she can electrocute them because her body is electrified. Like she has no control over that. And her touching them could be deadly if they're a human being. If they're a vampire, they'll be mostly fine for like an hour or so, but eventually like it's damaging. The only person in the world that she can touch is Vlad because I don't know if I mentioned this yet. Vlad is pyrokinetic. So he can control fire, which means that he's fireproof. So she can't electrocute him. He's literally the only person in the world that she can touch. <sighs> Guys, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, that's like basically the gist of the series. It's about them getting together, figuring out more of Layla's mysterious abilities, trying to win a war against this man called Zalagi, who like held a grudge for Vlad for hundreds of years and like came out of the woodwork and is now trying to kill him for some reason. There's some other stuff like finer details, but we will we'll get there. <laughs> oh, we will get there. And speaking of Zalagi, what the fuck was Zalagi's plan? Like, oh my god, dude. The whole plot of the first book is that this man named Zalagi, whom Vlad thought he killed hundreds of years ago, is now popping out of the woodwork to try and kill Vlad because I guess he's jealous of him. I don't know. That, that's, that's the only explanation he ever gave. I'm jealous because the church liked him better. Like, okay, cool. It's been hundreds of years, but okay, cool. So Vlad thinks that Zalagi is dead and had no reason to search for him. He didn't even want to believe Layla when she was like, yeah, I think I saw this dude. And he was like, it can't be that guy. No, no way, I killed him. Like. He was not looking for Zalagi at all. He had no reason to want him dead at all, to try to kill him at all, to want anything to do. He was not on Vlad's mind. He would have survived if he just kept his head down. Like that's the part that infuriates me the most. Like the way that these vampires have been crafted in this world, their emotions are just very heightened and they honestly don't seem like they would actually be able to function at all. Just the fact that he was so hell-bent on getting revenge over nothing. Like he had nothing to get revenge over. He was just jealous of Vlad. He had already stayed alive for hundreds of years right under Vlad's nose. But he just threw that out because, oh, I'm gonna kill him. Like, come on. Do you know who you're messing with? Vlad is just so classically overpowered. Like he could, he's pyrokinetic. As I said, he can literally make someone explode after, like with a thought, like after just touching them once. Like he can just make you explode. <laughs> like it doesn't, like there's nothing you can do. Like he, 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 let's say that like by some miracle, Zalagi did succeed in killing Vlad. He, he never would, but let's say he did. Vlad's allies, Cat, Bones, Mancaris, who is literally like a surrogate father to Vlad, they would never, ever for a million years let this man live. Every single ally of Vlad's would absolutely clobber this man. He would not survive that. Even a few of Vlad's enemies would probably kill him and be like, yeah, well, you took the opportunity to kill this man from me. Plus, there are probably just a bunch of people who would be like, yeah, I'm so eager to kill the person who killed an unkillable figure in our undead world. Like, I just don't really understand like revenge plots. I really don't. Cause like, what is your plan afterward? Sure, you got your revenge. Woo, cathartic, now what? You just wasted so much time and energy on revenge when you could have just let it go and had a good life on your own. Like, it's just so irrational. And I guess that's the point. It gets to the point where it's like, honestly, I can't even find it plausible anymore. Cause I feel like at some point you would just realize like, this is not worth my time. I need to stop, you know, but not Zalagi. No, 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 not Zalagi. And honestly, not Vlad either. <laughs> also, speaking of father figures, oh my God, I think conspiracy theory, Tanak is still alive, okay? I know that his death is like the one death that we're supposed to be like, yeah, he's dead. Like he's just, he's dead. He's just a character that we hear about in passing, but I don't believe for one second that that man is dead. We barely hear anything about his death, just that he killed himself and that's it. That's all we ever hear about him. Like, Tenok, Ten Tenok is alive. Like, I'm telling you, I am telling you, unless Janine Frost, like 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt confirms that Tenok is dead, 
I am going to always believe in a small piece of my heart that he's not dead. I can't believe that he's dead. I want Layla to like go on like a hunt for him. Like, I don't even know, like just go on a hunt for his essence or something and like find him. While Layla's out finding Tenok, she can also find Bones' one friend who like ran off to find Kane or whatever. Like, I bet both of them are still alive. I bet it's connected. I, I, I bet it's connected somehow. I just feel it. I just feel it in my bones, okay? Okay? Just don't ask me any more questions about that. The Night Prince series is literally like my second favorite series of all time. I think about it literally every single day. A lot of it has to do with my undying love for Layla. Like she's my favorite fictional character that has ever been committed to the pages. Like I love her. It's actually kind of a, an obsessive thought pattern. Like I think about her literally every day. Like if I'm not doing something else, I am thinking about her. It's probably not like altogether super healthy, but like, I don't know what it is. I'll just be like chilling and then I'll think of a scenario and she'll just pop into my head and then I'll like have to act it out. It's like those TikToks, you know those TikToks where it's like me crying about my dead family and then someone knocks on the door and it's like, hey, come to dinner. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm coming mom. And then you go, it's like that, except I'm thinking about Layla. Like, I don't know, I don't know how else to describe it. Literally no joke. Like the entire time I've been editing this, I've been imagining like how, <laughs> like how Layla and Vlad would react if they saw this video. Video. like it's so it's so bad for me it's like really not great oh my god i'll find myself like having full mental conversations with her like i don't know she just feels very real to me i know it sounds really crazy it probably is really crazy in a lot of my hardest times when i was like in middle school in the beginning of high school too i would find myself just asking like what would layla do right now i knew what she would do i knew exactly what she would do because she, she'd been in a lot of situations or felt a lot of ways that i had been feeling at the time. I didn't want to feel alone and I think her character always made me feel like I wasn't alone. You know what I mean? It's 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 really hard to explain. I think what it comes down to is that she felt outcast in her own family and she tried to kill herself. Then she wound up running away and claiming her own life and in a roundabout way finding something that was good for her. Finding people who cared about her and loved her in a way. <laughs> we'll get to that. I had been going through a lot of the same things around the same age and that was when I was reading these books. I don't know. I had a lot of fantasies back then about like what if I ran away too? I'll meet her on the road somewhere and we'll be like carnies together and Marty will pick us up and I don't know. I, I just felt very connected to her in that way. I felt like she was really my friend. Which sounds super stupid. Part of it was that I was very, very young. I felt very, very lonely and I didn't know how to cope with it at that point. She was going through a lot of the same things that I was going through. So I was like, this person is just like me or I'm just like her. And she got her life together so I can get my life together. She became kind of an example to me of being better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. That's that's kind of how it felt. I, I think at the end of the day, that's pretty much why I find it really difficult to let her go. Even though her relationship with Vlad is toxic and abusive and I'm not a huge fan of the way that she's been written, I just feel this very deep connection with her. And it's hard to explain, like it's really hard to explain, but yeah, I, I don't know. In particular, there's this one scene in the first book, Once Burned, it's right after Layla's been captured by psycho pervert Jackal and Twitchy. And Jackal is like, hey, we'll kill you if you don't help us find Vlad. And her inner voice is like, just let them kill you because you'll be better off anyway. You're already a burden. And she's like, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna fight. I'm not gonna just lay down and let this happen to me and she gets her shit together. That was the first time I think in a book that I ever like really truly felt seen. I was like maybe 12 at the time and I was already for a while having like really depressive suicidal thoughts like that. I hadn't read a book up to that point where a character expressed it in that way that I had been experiencing it. I mean, it just felt very like visceral to me. Like, wow, this is a character who experiences this exact same thing that I experienced. Like, even though she's not real, it felt like she knew me. 
you know, I don't know how else to say it. That's basically what I'm trying. I, you get what I mean. Or if you don't, whatever. <laughs> now that we've talked about the actual Night Prince, I think now we have to talk about Vlad and Layla. <laughs> the, the ride just never stops with these two, I feel like. I have concerns. Mostly around Vlad and Layla's relationship. Honestly, mostly just around Vlad because in my eyes, Layla can do no wrong. And Vlad is like, don't get me wrong. I love Vlad. I really do. But once burned, like not even just once burned, the entire Night Prince series just really features some disgusting moments between them. There's no way to express it other than to say it's repulsive, the things that he does to her and the things that she lets him do to her. The book begins with Vlad like really earnestly trying to seduce Layla. She had a vision of them like having sex and she's like, I don't, I don't want to do that actually. I don't like you because you're crazy, obviously. And he's like, I, you're wrong. And he like challenges her to a bet to be with Maximus, who is one of his people, one of his servants, one of his most loyal friends for centuries. He's like, yeah, Maximus, come try to seduce this girl. And I, I bet you can't. I bet she wants me so much that she'll never actually like you. So they end up going on dates and stuff. And Maximus is actually interested in her. But then Vlad still keeps trying to seduce her. Like he doesn't leave her alone. Like he's constantly like, hey, Layla, and like getting all up in her space. And then literally like two days later, he's like, oh yeah, Maximus, remember when I said you could like pursue her romantically? Never mind. And Maximus just has to be fine with that. He even like threatens Maximus when he's not fine with that because obviously you just like manipulated him. And even earlier than that, there's a scene where Layla doesn't believe that Vlad is actually Dracula, which is fair because like, that's kind of, you know. What he does in response to this is he grabs his family ring and he forces her to touch it and experience generations of torture and murder just to make the point that he is Dracula. When I say that she's a psychic and she experiences these things like they're happening to her, it's not just like, oh, wow, that's so crazy. It's like she feels it in her own body. She feels every single sensation that these people are going through. He basically tortures and murders her over and over and over again just to make her understand that he is in fact Dracula. Keep in mind, this is the very same man who just coddled Kat and like let her stay in her room and cry all day instead of dealing with her problems. I think in the timeline, this would have only been like two or three years prior to this book. So keep that in mind. This is the same man. This is the same man. Vlad eventually does manage to seduce her because obviously it's a romance novel. Right before they're about to have sex for the first time, he says the dumbest thing I have ever ever heard a male lead say in a romance novel. I feel like they all say like some version of this, but I think Vlad just puts it in the most ridiculous way possible. He says, I can give you honesty, monogamy, and more passion than you can stand, but not love. That emotion died in me long ago. Unlike the other like Night Huntress world books, I reread this series like every couple months. That line, it's in here and it's so fucking stupid. Like it's just so despicable because like hearing that this dude who literally coerced, manipulated and harassed because yes, it was harassment. He harassed her until she eventually was like, okay, fine, I'll have sex with you. And this man is basically telling her, yeah, I'll never love you. Like, how is that not scarring for her? And she brushes it off in the moment like it doesn't matter, but like, come on, it totally does. Cause like literally by the end of the month, like she's ride or die in love with this man. So it, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And then, oh my God, at the end of this book, at the end of Once Burned, we're still on book one, guys. Layla's being tortured. She has the ability to like psychically link with people. He can read minds. So when she psychically links to him, he can hear her in his head and they can communicate like that. She gets captured at the end of this book and she's getting tortured and she refrains from psychically linking to him to ask for help because she doesn't want him to be traumatized. It's a very sad scene. Cause like it starts out with her just being like, yeah, 
I've started ranking the levels of pain. And then later when she gets free, she's like, yeah, I just didn't want to traumatize you. And he's like, oh, that's so sweet. Like, what the fuck? It's not. It's so weird. I just, I wish it stopped there. I wish that the first book held all the real examples of how atrocious their relationship is. But it only gets worse. It, it really, it only gets worse, guys. In book two, Twice Tempted, basically the book starts off with her being like, he's not interested in me anymore. He's gonna break up with me. And she's really apprehensive about it because she knows at this point, like she's in love with him. And he's just acting very aloof and distant. And then he's like, oh yeah, I bought you a dress. Oh yeah, we're having a dinner party tonight. And she's like, really? Wow, okay. And then she gets changed, she gets dressed, she goes down to the dinner party and he's like, oh my God, you look so beautiful. I'm so into you. And she's like, wow, okay. And then what he does is he gets up in the middle of this dinner party with all of these very important undead persons. And he's like, Layla, I have a very serious question to ask you. And he pulls out a ring box and he kneels on the floor and he opens it and there's a ring in there. And she's like, oh my God, is this a marriage proposal? Her sister's there too. And she also thinks it's a marriage proposal. And then he's like, what? No, I would never marry you. You know that. I'm just asking you if you want to be a vampire. Only humiliates her in front of this entire table of people who like in one way or another are going to be like her peers and her allies one day because like she's already a person possessing like unprecedented power. So it's like once she is turned into a vampire, like people are going to have to respect her. And yet Vlad doesn't care about that because he just totally humiliated her in front of all of these people. Like, I guess it was a stupid assumption. Like he did literally say like, I'll never be able to love you. But I mean, if you were with a dude, <laughs> if you were with anyone and then one day he's just like, yeah, I'm all about you. I got you this new gift come to dinner and then he like kneels in front of you and pulls out a ring box like you're gonna have some thoughts right especially since she didn't know that the ring thing is like just what he does when he turns someone so it's just like i get why she thought that and the fact that everyone else at the table was just like yikes that sucks for you and she was just so embarrassed and he passed it off like it was her folly like no sir that's your fault what are you doing inevitably Layla leaves him because he's a piece of shit. And most of like, I guess the first half of book two is about Layla hunting down a new big bad and trying to kill them because they tried to kill her in a bombing that she only survived because Vlad's, she's like coated in Vlad's aura. He's pyrokinetic, remember? So like he's fireproof. Coating her in his aura makes her fireproof too. She's on the road with Maximus because Maximus came with her when she left to like drop her off and everything but he like stuck around to make sure she was okay and once he found out about the bombing he like stuck around to help her figure out who tried to kill her. They have a lot of chemistry, they have a few moments because he's still into her from book one but she's like still in love with Vlad obviously so it's like a no-go and honestly I'm not too upset about that. Like it was bad enough when we were just dealing with Vlad's 600 years versus like 25 years but now we're dealing with Maximus's 1000 years and Layla's 25 years. Not only in this book do we find out that he's a thousand years old, we find out that he was a crusader. He's a fucking liar too. Like he's just straight up lying to her this entire time. Like honestly fuck all of the men in all of these books because they're all assholes except for Ian. Ian is pretty great. Also, Marty is a skinny legend. Oh, Samir. Samir's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, we barely get to see any of him, but he's pretty cool too, I guess. And then that one demon guy. I forget what his name is, but he was an Into the Fire. He seemed all right. Well, Bones is okay if you just don't factor in any of Destin for an early grave. At some point, though, they end up in a bind and they're captured. They're on a boat. Maximus is incapacitated and Layla is there with about a dozen human hostages who are dying. She doesn't know what to do. So she links to Vlad and she's like, hey, please come help me. Like, I don't know what to do. I'm stuck here. I need your blood to heal these people. And Vlad shows up with men carries and guess what he does? I bet you can guess. I, I bet you can. This man with his cold, dead, disgusting, narcissistic, sociopathic, obsessive heart 
He says he will leave these humans to die unless Layla comes with him back to Romania. Bear in mind, they're broken up because he humiliated her. She literally left the country and went home to get away from him. And at this point, she's been led to believe that he might have had something to do with the bombing because, you know, he's a sociopath and she dumped him and she left him and that's humiliating for him. So Maximus has been telling her, he is a liar, but he's been telling her like, he might have had something to do with it, which honestly isn't super far-fetched if we're being honest with, with ourselves. And honestly, that's also a huge red flag, like a huge red flag that she even believed that he was capable of doing something like that. Like if the person who loves you most in the world is still able to believe that you are capable of murdering someone and trying to kill them and doing all of this evil stuff enough that they're gonna believe someone who tells them that, like that is, that is your fault. The people who love you don't wanna believe that you're capable of doing those kinds of things. So got some answering to do Vlad. She went on a limb and still asked for help because she didn't know what else to do. And he's now going to say, the only way I'm going to save the lives of these 12 people is if you come back to Romania with me. After she literally says no the first time. Like the first time he's like, oh no, you're coming back with me. And she's like, no, I'm not. You make me uncomfortable. We're broken up. I don't want to be around you. And he's like, well, I'm not going to save these people unless you do. This is a man who prides himself on not being a liar. And yet this is the second time that they've made a deal like this. And he's reneged or like messed around with the promise that she extracted from him just so that it can fit his needs. It's sick. Cause like, how are you not a liar when you're doing stuff like this? And he always gets so mad at her when she calls him out for it. Like you lied to me, you're changing the rules. He's like, no, I'm not a liar. Don't call me a liar. I'll kill you or whatever. Like he's just, he's a child. He's a fucking child. It doesn't stop there either guys. It really doesn't. Book two is just very, very, very long and very grueling. Immediately once they get back, Vlad tries to seduce her again and because she's still in love with him like she's down she's all the way down all she wants from him is to admit that he's also in love with her because at this point he is <laughs> like every it's kind of obvious now every single person who has captured her and tried to kill her has literally basically point blank said yeah i'm doing this to get back at vlad because he's in love with you and it'll hurt him if something hurts you. Like everyone has said that. Everyone knows that he's in love with her. Everyone knows except him. Like it's just really, it's, it's, uh, I don't even know. <laughs> when she says like, sure, I will totally be down to clown with you again if you just admit how you feel about me. Once again, Vlad just takes the cake for a stupid ass line in rebuttal. And I was literally cringing and crying and laughing at the same time when I read this part. This man, he says, you don't really love me. You love the version of me that you've made up. You don't want me to love you. You think I'm the knight, even though I'm the dragon and I always will be. <laughs> He's the dragon, guys. He's not the knight. <laughs> He's the dragon. Just soak that one in. Soak that one in, lad. Guess what he does next? Guess, guess, guess. I bet you can't. I bet you can't guess. He fucking runs away and flies out of the window. Vlad is just a dreamboat, guys. He's <laughs> just a dreamboat, guys. Layla at this point is just desperate to prove him wrong. She's desperate to prove like, no, you dumb fuck. I don't love a version of you that I made up. So she goes down to the armory and she fucking, <sighs> she touches everything in the armory so that she can like get a better grasp of the person that Vlad was back then and the person that he is now. But the thing is in this book, there's like this whole thing going on with like her abilities killing her. So it's like, as she's doing this, she's like hemorrhaging to death. Every time she touches a new thing, like it makes her abilities like cause her to hemorrhage. So basically she's just like hemorrhaging to death the whole time. And then she like actually falls down and like starts dying, like actually dying. And that's when Vlad comes in and he's like, what the fuck? She's like holding the crown. <laughs> So basically she 
hemorrhages and dies. But Vlad is able to save her because he like just cuts his entire body open to feed her his blood so she can heal. It's only at this point that he is able to admit to her that he is in love with her. I can't even say that it's entirely his fault. Like she's acting some kind of crazy as well. Guess what Vlad did while she was recovering from almost literally dying? Guess what he did? He planned their wedding without even asking her if she wanted to marry him, without ever having discussed anything about what either of them would want in a wedding at all. He planned their wedding. And it's happening that night that she finally got out of the hospital and all of their guests are already starting to arrive. And this is also when he decides to tell her that he loves her for the first time. When he's telling her that he planned their wedding. She gets out of the hospital, is like, where, where are my clothes? And then goes and finds out that her clothes are in his room because he moved them there. And he's like, hey, we're getting married tonight. And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah, I love you. We're getting married tonight. Everyone's already arriving. And it's supposed to come off as like this really sweet moment, but it doesn't come off like that. It just, it doesn't come off like that at all. For the first time, I was like almost completely on Hugh's side when he was thinking about grabbing the knife. Like I was like, I was almost right there with him. Even when I first read this book, I was screaming like, Layla, do not marry him. He is such a bitch. Like what the fuck? Like don't marry him. But she did. She sure did. Basically to summarize the whole second half of the book, Vlad and Layla are betrayed by Shrapnel who is like one of Vlad's inner circle and like one of his best friends and Layla ends up dying for the second time in this book. She's brought back as a vampire this time. There's pretty much like a spell on her that causes her to want to kill herself whenever she uses her abilities. So Vlad like forbids her from using her power because he doesn't want her to die obviously. But what he does is he says, Layla, if you use your powers again, I will imprison you. <laughs> this is literally what he says to her. Like almost verbatim, if you use your powers again, I will imprison you. And then he runs away again, like a child. He runs away and he goes to his dungeon to torture people until he feels better. Like it's really fucking weird, dude. At this point, by the way, yes, they are married. They've been married for a couple days at this point, I think. There's other gross stuff that happens at the end of book two. Like I think Layla gets attacked by a bunch of sewer rats and like some ghouls or something. But like I, as far as like what Vlad does to her, I think that's it. But Bound by Flames, Vlad's abusive behavior hasn't stopped or lessened or caused him like any type of shame. This man is in it to win it. If there were an award for like most abusive husband, I think he, I think he's trying to win. Not only is he abusive and like just as gross and awful as before, but we literally kick off the story with it once again. At the start of this book, they're throwing a party to try to weed out like any spies for the enemy. This one is not a dinner party though. It's a masquerade ball and Layla needs to be able to use her abilities to do this, to like touch them, to see if they've got any like bad vibes on them, I guess. But when a vampire that she's trying to like suss out tries to sexually assault her, Vlad steps in and he like kills the dude who's trying to assault his wife, obviously. But then he becomes angry with her. He blames her for going off with him, even though it wasn't her fault. Like she's with a vampire who's like 400 years old to her 26 years old at this point. And he's like pulling her off into an alcove and he like humiliates her in front of this whole party of people. Like it's really, really sad. How are you gonna blame your wife? for almost being the victim of an attempted sexual assault. Like that just doesn't make any sense. And then once they get back up to their bedroom, he's like still blaming her, but he tries to frame it in this way that's like, I just can't imagine what would have happened. Like, I just, I can't let anything happen to you. I love you so much. And then they bone. Like Layla, stop fucking with this man. Oh my God. The next day when Layla wakes up, her abilities are mysteriously not working. Three guesses why. Vlad has once again covered her in his aura. And like I said before, his aura makes her fireproof, but it also coincidentally makes her powers stop working. He used them having sex to come into contact with each other so that she would be distracted and she wouldn't notice him covering her in his aura. I think book two 
definitely has like a higher volume of things that Vlad does directly to Layla that are like sick and twisted and disgusting. But I think the quantity versus the quality here is definitely uh it 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 goes it it it's <laughs> Yes, there's more bad things that happen in book one and book two that Vlad does to her, but what book three lacks in the amount of things it makes up for in the intensity and the repulsiveness of what happens. Vlad has to go meet up with Maximus at, a, at some other location because Maximus is like running a spy operation for him right now. So like they're going to exchange some information. But the second Vlad leaves, guess what happens? Guess what happens? Zalagi, who's miraculously somehow still alive, manages to attack the castle and captures Layla. Ah, uh, it's just so ironic as well. It's completely Vlad's fault. Like she wanted to go with him, but he was like, no, you're safer here. Like, dude, she's only safe here because you're here. Like you're the one who protects the castle. And like the second he left, everybody died. He's the dumbest motherfucker I've ever encountered on the pages of a novel. Like, I don't know what his problem is. All he does in book one is just go on and on and on about how smart he is and how much of a like good war strategist he is. And then he does dumb shit like this in book three. So Layla's captured and she's tortured for about two weeks. And it's like some really extreme torture kind of thing. Like, I guess all torture is extreme, but like reading it was a very visceral and uncomfortable and emotionally devastating experience for me. Like I literally cried the entire time. It was just very bad. I'll save you the specifics because it, it's it's really, it's awful and it's disgusting. Zalagi tapes all of it and he sends the videos back to Vlad so that Vlad can watch them. He also uploads these videos to like, I guess the vampire version of YouTube. I don't know, but he uploads the videos on there so that other people can watch the videos and ridicule Vlad for not being able to protect his own wife. Yeah, it's so incredibly sickening in every possible way, and it's all Vlad's fault. But long story short, eventually Vlad saves Layla and gets her out of there. And literally for the next like 30 to 40 pages, it's literally just Layla trying to find a way to apologize to Vlad for what she went through while being tortured because he had to watch it. So she's just worried about him being traumatized by it. Which of course ends with Vlad once again telling Layla that he's going to marry her. Like he doesn't ask, he just tells her. And they have the wedding and it's officiated by men carries and I don't like men carries, but he's at it again. Gretchen is also there. I don't know if she attended the wedding, but it's, 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 it's something, it's something. Book four. The last one, guys, we made it. The last one. Into the Fire is not so much about Vlad being abusive to Layla in this one, because I think at this point, he's pretty much just like beaten her completely down. Like she's not the same woman that she was and not even in like a good way, in a very frightening way. Like she's different. And it's it's it very much comes across in this book, especially. I think this book is mostly just about Vlad acting stupid and then Layla feeling responsible for his behavior. Um, um, the biggest thing that happens in this one is that Vlad almost kills Layla. Like literally, he almost he almost kills her. Basically what happens is he's under the influence of a spell that makes him see his worst sin over and over and over and over and over again. His worst sin is watching one of those torture videos that he got in the last book and he just keeps replaying that in his head over and over and over again. But anyway, this spell is making him burn everything in the area. And obviously they have to get him to stop because they're drawing attention to themselves. So Layla goes in to try and help Mel and he burns her within an inch of her life. And he's not like in his right mind when he's doing it, but like he still burns her within an inch of her life. Once she like wakes him up and he sees that she is like, dead basically on the floor he like starts begging like Layla don't die what does he say you have to heal my darling heal heal please and he says please and it's supposed to be like a big thing because like it he's made a thing in every single book about how he doesn't say the word please because he hears it all the time when he's torturing people so 
the word please means nothing to him, but he says it because she's about to die. So romantic, right? Yeah, I guess. On their ride back to the safe house after he almost just killed her, she once again feels the need to apologize to him because she just can't imagine how traumatizing it must have been for him to see her almost being dead on the floor. This woman, dude, like what? No self-respect. He basically realizes in the car like, oh, I was so freaked out that you were dead on the floor basically that I covered you in my aura again, again with this fucking aura thing. The way that he tries to see if he did it is he tries to burn her. And of course, at the sight of the fire, she like flinches. She's like, oh my God, because like she almost just died in a fire. And then he gets all moody and she like has to apologize again for having PTSD for almost being burned to death by her husband. <laughs> as much as I can't stop loving their story and rereading their story, this is a toxic relationship, my friends. There's, there's no other way to put it. I think I started to realize that like more and more as I read the books as I got older. Like I read Once Burned when I was still very, very young and then Twice Tempted when I was a bit older. And I think that was the first time that I started to realize like, mm -mm, no. And then like reading the last two when I was like edging out of middle school and into high school, I think realizing then like, yeah, this is sick. Like what he's doing to her is sick in the head. It's just really sad. Even even reading the boat scene for the first time, like I think I was 13 when I read the boat scene in Twice Tempted and just reading that then I was still thinking like, what the hell? Like, what is this? Like not even Min Carey, like Min, Min Carey didn't even step in. Like he didn't even step in and say, Vlad, as your surrogate father figure, I think that you need to stop acting like a fucking dumbass. Like, what are you doing? You're gonna save these people. Or he could have saved them. Like, it's just as much on him as it is on Vlad. Like, why are you just gonna let him do this? Like, that's so fucked up and twisted. But he didn't do that. I think this is, like, really what made me stop liking him Carries because he's just an enabler for Vlad's disgusting behavior. Like, I know it's not all on Men Carries, but... It kind of is a little bit because Mancarius is literally the only person that Vlad will ever listen to. Like there's that one scene in Once Burned where Bones and Kat and Mancarius and Kira come to visit Vlad at his house. Vlad and Bones are about to like start arguing and get into a fight just like always. And Mancarius literally is just like Vlad. And then Vlad just stops, like no questions asked. He just stops. He respects Men Carries. He sees him as a father figure. It's it's Men Carries' responsibility to try to guide him to not act like a fucking bitch all the time, but he doesn't do that. He just lets Vlad do whatever he's gonna do. Then again, there is that scene in Into the Fire where Vlad pretends to murder Men Carries. But honestly, I don't, I feel like that was just like supposed to be a catalyst for Ian and Veritas' story because that made no sense otherwise. And honestly, that's a good segue. That's a great segue into Ian and Veritas. Let's talk about Ian and Veritas for a second, because goddamn, I check Janine Frost's website a lot because I am interested in her and I want to keep up with her and what she's writing. And I remember the day in my freshman year when I saw that fucking announcement for Ian's story go live. I remember that day. I remember that day, guys. I remember that day. I was so excited because he's like literally the only main character in the whole, in all of it, who is gay. Or at least not straight. Like I'm pretty sure Annette died in a novella somewhere. So Ian's all we've got left, right? So it's like, I was just so excited for his story, like so excited to see what was going on. I was so excited to get a gay storyline because I really thought like, oh, he's our only not straight character. We've seen him with men before. So hopefully this is gonna be a thing, right? No, no, it wasn't. I should have known. The moment I read Into the Fire and Veritas is there and she's like, you know Dagon? Literally like shit, shit. She's involved with the Dagon plot. She's a woman. They're gonna be love interests. Like I knew from that moment, but like I just held out hope. I was like, oh my God, let me not because I don't want to put that into the universe. I'm just gonna hope and believe that she's not gonna be the love interest. But then imagine my fucking despair. Imagine my despair. What the fucking, 
when the description is released and the first name I see is Veritas. <laughs> I was so mad. I was so upset. Like I literally cried. Like I saw Veritas's name and I didn't read the description. Like I just turned off my phone and went to sleep. Like I was so upset. I think I only like just now actually read the descriptions of all of the books because I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't at that time. And it's been like four years, almost five years, honestly. I just couldn't do it. I, I was not feeling it. I was so mad. And the kicker is like, I know it's good. I know that they're all so good because Ian is a great character. I loved seeing him and Layla become friends and Into the Fire. I've loved every single bit of him that we've gotten in all of the Night Huntress books. And the little that we've seen of Veritas has been like so much fun. Like, what's that one? Where they're fighting the ghoul dude. I forgot what that one was called. But you know what I'm talking about. You know which one I'm talking about, right? You know which one I'm talking about. Or you don't. Whatever. I know which one I'm talking about. And the one where they're fighting the ghoul. Like I thought Veritas was really cool at the end when she was fighting with them. I really loved her in Into the Fire. Like her abilities are sick as fuck. Like I really, I'm interested in both of them. Like I know it's good. I was just disappointed because like we have no gay storylines from Janine Frost at all. And I kind of get it because like that's not the audience that she's writing for. So like why would she write about gay people? Like there's that one gay guy who was like in One Grave at a Time, but he's like irrelevant to literally everything. Like he, he only serves the purpose of being a sidekick to the plot like occasionally, like he does nothing. And it's not like we ever get to see like a love arc with him or anything. Like, like we have no gay storylines at all. And it's just very disheartening. Either way, I still have yet to read the Night Rebel series. I will eventually but like I'm just kind of taking my sweet time like I'm not I'm I don't want to rush it I don't I'm like still nursing my wounds <laughs> like I just I can't and I know that Layla's in it like I know that Layla's in it and I know I should read it I don't know <laughs> eventually i am absolutely biased but i just think that layla is an absolute angel like i just love her i think that she's like everything that anyone could ever want and more and i wish that vlad would treat her better she's willing to do so many unspeakable things for him and to please him and i guess that's like a shortcoming on her part but at the same time that's exactly what he demands of her like if she's not willing to do these horrible things, then he thinks that she doesn't actually love him. Like she literally lets her family members die. Like Marty dies in, in Into the Fire, Gretchen dies in Into the Fire. Like she's turned, but like she still died. It's a very sad thing to see her character degrade over the course of the books. Like I have had times where I'll read book four and then I'll go back to book one and reread that. And the difference between her, it's just night and day and not in a good way, not in it like, like I've undergone a transformative character arc kind of way. It's in a, I have degraded and lost who I am within all of this chaos that my husband is constantly getting himself into. That's how it reads to me. It's just, it's, it's, it's devastating and it's sick to see that her innermost thoughts have changed from like, I'm trying to respect myself and trying to get better to just vlog all the time. And I think the implication is supposed to be that he's thinking about her in that way as well. And I don't think that that's too far fetched of an idea. I just think that it's in very different ways. Like the way that she's thinking about him is like a love sort of way. Like I love him and he's part of my life now. I'd do anything for him. And the way that he's thinking about her is like, she's my possession. You know what I mean? Like it's very, I just think it's very very, very different. Like I said, I think what really made her resonate with me when I first read book one is that I saw so much fight in her character, but at this point that fight is gone. The only reason in book three where she like stamps out that sad sick voice in her head is because she's trying to talk to Vlad and he's having fatalistic thoughts and she's like no Vlad you can't have those thoughts. So then she stops having those thoughts. Like she's not even doing it for herself. She's doing it for him. She just got no self-respect and he doesn't respect her either. Definitely doesn't care about her or respect her enough to try to get rid of his demons like she is. It's just it's so sad to see a woman of her caliber and her power just completely buckling to a man like Vlad, especially because that is not at all how Kat's story went. Like Kat is still a strong, 
independent, completely powerful, highly respected woman, both in the undead world and by her husband and her friends. And yet everyone in this world just doesn't give a shit about Layla. Like the only person that we've seen so far in the entire Night Prince series who's actually looked at Layla and been like, you got something is Ian. He's the only one who actually respects her. Honestly, it makes me want to cry a little bit. Even with all of that said though, I do still like Vlad. I just have a lot of concerns about him, namely what he's been up to in the 581 years before he met Layla. I told you we were gonna have to come back to pedophilia. <laughs> I, uh, I... When Vlad and Layla first meet, she sees his worst sin, allowing his first wife Clara to die tragically. Are we seeing a pattern here? Are we seeing a pattern with Vlad's behavior? Every single time that Clara is brought up in conversation, she's always described as a young woman. And then they discuss how much Vlad loved her and how much he loved their son. How young was this woman? Because Vlad was the last prince and general of a dying country in the 1400s. And I think I and you and Janine Frost and anyone else who's ever taken a single history class in their life knows that this man was married to a child. Clara was a child. And the only reason she wasn't a child is because we want to like Vlad and we want to see him in a better light. And we don't want to think about the realities of the world that he lived in. I just don't enjoy how in so many books, they just completely overlook certain aspects of these characters' lives, especially vampires, because they want us to see them in a better light. When it's like, no, you know that this is what they were doing. And I'm, I don't like them anyway. He's still a piece of shit. Like, I um, I can already feel the arguments coming that Janine just like didn't want to write about pedophilia and therefore she didn't. I'm not saying that she had to write about it, but I'm saying that in one of her books, I'm pretty sure it was destined for an early grave even, they have that whole scene where Cat and Bones go to visit one of his former lovers who was 17, but she just looks very young. And the whole fucking time, Cat in her head is like calling out for being a pedophile. So clearly she's not afraid to touch the topic of pedophilia or the potential that her male characters were absolutely clowning on children. The fact that we, she doesn't write about Clara in that way just tells me she's only portraying Clara as a grown woman because we don't want to see Vlad as a pedophile. We don't want to acknowledge the fact that he was absolutely boning down with and impregnating a little girl. I've talked about this with my friends before and they've scoffed and been like, Cressy, no, that's not pedophilia. That's just how they did it back then. That is some absolute bullshit. They had brains that work just as well as mine or yours. They might not have had modern science to tell them that the prefrontal cortex was not fully developed, but they knew that marrying a 13 year old girl to a 35 year old man is not okay. Somebody had to have known that. They had to have known that. I do not believe for one second that everyone just thought that that was fine. Honestly, as much as it pains me to say, I think Vlad might just be a bad person. I think he totally knew it was wrong to do it, even back then. Throughout this entire series, he'll like have moments where he goes down to his dungeon and tortures people for fun. And you know, I don't think any normal person of modern times would think that that's an okay or kosher thing to do, but he still does it because in his words, he's not a modern man. So he'll do whatever he wants, regardless of the modern standards, right? So that tells me he would still be willing to do anything that was like cruel and gross and evil, despite what other people in the modern world would think, if he thought that it was truly a good or fun idea or anything that pleased him, really. So the fact that by the time Layla comes into his life, I honestly don't think that he would ever do anything like that to a child. That just tells me that he knew it was wrong back then and he was just waiting for society to give him an excuse to stop. Yeah, there's pressure to do it, especially back then if you're the prince and all of that, but just the fact that he actually impregnated her and then would go on to continuously throughout this series say, I loved her so much and I would do anything to like have her back and like all of this shit. Feel free to like fight me on this one in the comments. Maybe I'm just being stupid. Maybe I'm not seeing this the way that it should be seen. But honestly, I don't think I am. But I would love to know what you think about this because it's it's really shocking to me how many people are just willing to brush it off. Like that's just what they did back then. Yeah, that is what they did back then, but it's sick. I am positive almost to the 
core of my heart that they knew they shouldn't have been doing it but they did it anyway because they just didn't value the lives of those little girls. I don't think that they actually believed that they were women at all. I think they just did it because they could and that's really all there is to it. I know obviously that a big part of it was that they just decided like okay these girls have reached sexual maturity so they can have children now and that's why they did it and the reason that they had them married to such older men is because once they were older they had access to money and they could actually like take care of their wives but you look at that person and you see that that is still a child. There is absolutely no way that you look at a 13 year old little girl especially back then when everybody was sickly and tiny and you say yeah that's someone who is mature enough not only for sex but to also have children and be married like that's fucked up i don't know i'd love to know your take let, let me know what you think guys <laughs> to the one person watching this right now oh my god also to that one person thank you so much for sticking around i've been recording for like two hours and 20 minutes i don't know how long this video is actually going to turn out to be but it's a long one so thank you and if that one person is janine frost janine 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 you i have asked questions and I want answers, okay? Also, oh my god, Janine Frost, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, Janine Frost, oh my god! <sighs> oh my god, we're reaching the end! Uh, fucking finally, Jesus. So, why, why, why did I do this? Why did I make this fucking two hour and 20 minute video to talk about a series that I'm sure none of you have read? 10 years of pent up frustration, I'll start with that one. There's a lot in this series that I wanted to talk about for so fucking long and I was, I was gonna let it go, I really was, I swear. I was not planning on making this video but then, but then the other day I went onto her website to do just like a routine checkup to see what she was up to. Guys, she's writing her own Midnight Sun. She's writing Halfway to the Grave, which is book one of the Night Hunter series, but it's gonna be in Bones's perspective. Also, Kat's getting a new, a new novella, and I think that's what really pissed me off, because I was just like, are you serious? We've gotten seven books with Kat, a bunch of novellas, we're getting a Midnight Sun. Can we get something about Layla, please? Like, I just fuck god the reason that i keep checking is not for cat it's for layla like i like cat i will definitely be reading this midnight sun but i will always be looking out for more with layla because honestly i'm kind of tired of cat i just want layla i desperately want her to have another book or another short story or the, or another novella like i just love this character so much and she's been done so dirty and just left out to dry like I want to see her further her own abilities and have her own adventures without Vlad looking over her shoulder and being abusive and shit, just like cats have the opportunity to do. There's so much more of Layla's story to explore. Like she's, it's just, it's not finished. It's not finished. It isn't. Oh, I feel like that's another thing that pisses me off about the Night Rebel series. I know she's in it. I know she's in the Night Rebel series. She has to be. There's no way she's not, even briefly. I know I have to read it, but it's just like, fuck, like, can Layla get something, please? It just really fucking hurts to know that that's her story and that's how it ends. Like, it's just a very bleak. In conclusion, um... Yeah, I don't know. I'm bad at conclusions. I don't, I, I don't know. Go read these books if you want to. It's, it's really a wild ride. I definitely recommend the audiobooks. Tavia Gilbert is like the best narrator ever in my opinion. Honestly, sometimes I think I like hallucinated this entire thing. If I didn't know for a fact that it is real, I wouldn't think that it was real. I, <laughs> cause it's just so wild. I kind of wish that Passion Flicks would like do an adaptation of something of Janine Frost. I've seen Wicked which was the adaptation of Jennifer L. Armentrout's book of the same name. It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. It was, it stayed very, very close to the source material. I also saw Afterburn and Aftershock, which is the adaptation of Sylvia Day's novel, or her two novellas of the same name. And I think that was the same, like it stayed very, very close to the source material. I think it got like almost every single point that was in the actual books. It's been a while since I read that. I think I also read those books when I was like 10 or 12. Yeah, I read a lot of adult romance when I was a child. Like maybe, definitely, definitely.
definitely too much so i think it'd be kind of fun to see janine frost's work like actually translated into film maybe <laughs> maybe one day who knows probably never <laughs> yeah even with all the shit talk that i had about vlad i would still marry him if any vampire came up to me right now and was like hey i'm a vampire you best believe you bet your bottom fucking dollar I am marrying that person. I will get down on my knees and beg them to marry me. That is, that is an opportunity I cannot pass up. Vlad is rich. He has the ability to make me immortal. I am not turning that down. If you were a vampire, would you be all depressed and emo like Edward? Or do you think you'd be like a hot thotty like Bones? Do you think Jacob ever had a chance? Cause like there's a part in the book where she's like, I would only consider being with Jacob if Edward didn't exist. Like, I think from that point on, I knew, like, Jacob's out of the running. He's, he, no, fuck you. He's out of the running. Between vampires and ghouls, which would you rather be? Because ghouls can still taste food, which is something that I would not be able to give up. Like, you cannot beat the experience of eating food. Especially if there's, like, no caloric, like, consequence. Like, you can eat as much as you want and it won't matter. Like, how could you possibly give up eating food? But on the flip side, if you're a ghoul, you can't compel people or like fly or like get any of those cool abilities like the vampires in the series have. Marie Laveau is pretty tricked out. Like she can call remnants and stuff, which is pretty cool. At the end of the day, I think I would really just want to be able, like pyrokinesis as much as, as ridiculous as it sounds. Like I kind of want to be able to do that, you know? <laughs> and like be able to freeze time, like shit. <laughs> I know that it would take like thousands of years to be able to get, but it still seems pretty cool to me. If I were gonna die, I would want to be able to compel people to do what I want. I don't know. Uh, which one would you be? Which one would you be? Tell me in the comments. Also, do you think that blood clots are like chicken nuggets to vampires? I've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs>